Yes, I'm excited about the, the sermon series that we've been, what we started last week of just, it's go time. We, we want to be reminded and refreshed on the, the mission of God. And so last week we started that. And um, if you haven't, if you weren't here last week, you want to catch up on that. If you want to listen to the message from last week, then go to, uh, go to our YouTube page. Look, look that up and subscribe, get notifications whenever one's posted. We normally try to um, stream live, but uh, we weren't able to get the, the computer to work for that um, tonight. So I'm going to record tonight and edit it and then put it on the YouTube page so you can uh, check it out later. Okay, so some of this will be edited out. So last week we did talk about uh, just the mission of God. We said it's go time. It said we said it's it's what God has called us to do. We um, we looked at Moses and how uh, God came to Moses with a mission for Moses to do, but He didn't just say, "Hey Moses, I'm God, take off and do this." He kind of unpacked and kind of unraveled of who who He was. And so, in effect, what we said is that the mission of God really begins with God revealing to us and just showing us who He is. And then once he shows us who he is, then he sends us as he entrusts us, just as Bradley prayed, we are entrusted with the mission of God. So God shows up on the scene in great glory, he reveals himself and says, here I am, I have, I'm compassionate, I'm a covenant keeping God, I'm faithful, and I've heard the cries of my people, and so I've come down to deliver them. And we say, well, maybe Moses was like, thumbs up, way to go, God, sounds great, they're that way. But then God says, now you go and you deliver my people. And that's the same thing that happened in the New Testament when Jesus walked for three years with his disciples, showed them how to live, taught them how to love, walked those dirty streets with people, touched people, loved people, and he said, all right, now I'm leaving. The mission of God is on you now. It's on your shoulders. And then he gives them the great commission to go and to proclaim the gospel to all the nations. Pontata ethne, to all nations. He says, go everywhere to the corner farthest corners of the earth and proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus baptizing them, teaching them but I'm going to be with you always, and he said really the best part of the mission of God is that God is God is with us, we get to be with him, so tonight what I want to talk about is still on the, on the, on the vein of uh, the mission of God but I want to talk about a, a major part of the mission of God and that is the work of God in the hearts of men that is God's work in our hearts. So when Jesus sent out his disciples to make disciples, what is that work in the heart of men that happens? Now, the, the simple word is salvation, but that's a churchy word. I've heard people ask people who've never even thought about going to church. They've asked them, are you saved? And they're like, saved from what? What are you talking about? Salvation is an easy word for Christian circles to kick around and talk about but if we don't know anything about what salvation is that's a good logical response saved from what last time I checked I'm not sinking in quicksand they haven't thrown me a stick to get me out of that I'm not floating down a river and drowning you're not throwing me a rescue tube or something like that but salvation is that is the work of God in the heart of man and so that's what we're called to do to take the mission of God the message of God out into the world, and then God does that work of salvation in the heart of man. So we're going to talk about salvation tonight. We can't, you know, to have this uh, comprehensive talk of, on salvation because there's, it's multifaceted. There's so much about it, but we will highlight some key points of salvation tonight, specifically coming from the book of Colossians tonight. So we're going to be lo looking at Colossians chapter two, verses six through six through fifteen. And there's a bunch in this passage that God has for us concerning salvation. Before we dive into it, let's ask God to help us with his word tonight. God, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would let us see what we need to see. God, I pray that you would teach us what we need to learn. God, I pray that you would give us what we need to receive. God, I pray that you would open up our eyes. I pray that you would open up our ears. God, open up our hearts to receive your word tonight. God, we love you. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We need your help tonight pray this in your good name. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, 6 through 15. Colossians itself is a beautiful passage and it has a lot to do with, with salvation. And, and Paul uh, shifts gears a little bit in Colossians chapter 2 as he's talking and speaking to the church in Colossae and he gets to, the, to this, 
this declaration that we're alive in Christ. It's because of the work of God through Christ that we're alive in salvation. And he says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Paul is talking about Christ. He's saying the whole fullness of God dwells. All that makes up who God is dwells in Christ. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. He's talking about the work that God is doing in our hearts here. By putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, really in our hearts. Having been buried with him in baptism. Now Paul talks about how that when you come alive in Christ, well, it's because you've been buried with him. And everyone who is a believer has been baptized. It's the first step of obedience. And Paul says you've been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So salvation is just blowing up in this passage right here. Paul says a lot right here. He says some really good stuff. And I want to pull out about five things that he talks about specifically. This passage right here, if I'm honest, I could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just unpacking every little nuance through the truth and through the text in this passage. But specifically, I want to look at salvation as regards to this passage here. First, number one, salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift. You see in um, that first, the very first verse that we we read, Colossians 2, says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, as you received him. Now, the Bible talks in many places about the gift that God does in our heart. Nobody earns salvation. Nobody works up to the point to where you're good enough and you get the prize of salvation. Makes me think of being in like Chuck E. Cheese or Dave and Buster's where if you hit something hard enough, that little light goes up to the top. And if you can get it all the way up to the green, then you are very much a winner and you get the top prize. And they rig that thing. Even uh, the biggest machoest guy in the world can come in here and break the hammer over that thing and still go all the way up to just the bottom of the green. We can't work hard enough to get to the pinnacle of where we could just earn God's favor. Over and over and over, the Bible continually slides that across the table to us. That, hey, this is a gift. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't get some kind of credit by building up to it and to where you can pay for it. It is a free gift. That's why it says, as you received Christ. And I love love talking about salvation being a gift. And I hear people talk about salvation, and uh, when when you think about a gift, and this is very kind of common way to think of it, but a gift is yours when it's been purchased for you. Some people say, some people say, if I had a gift, when is it your gift? And people are like, well, whenever you reach out and take it. No, that's not true. Because if, because if I take my kid to go shopping for your kid's birthday, and we buy some Paw Patrol something or another, and we bring it to the house, and it sits in our house for two weeks, it's still going to be your child's gift, even though I have it at my house. Why is it your child's gift? Because we purchased it. When you receive the gift of salvation, it's already been purchased. It's already been secured and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That's why God says, before the foundation of the world, God knew you in salvation. He purchased you according to his plan. Romans 3, 24 says, 
and are justified by his grace as a gift. So justified be, means that we are made right according to God's legal standards of perfection. So if we in our own strength, in our own merit, in our own work, if we're able to get into heaven, we have to be absolutely perfect in all things. We can't do that. We can't measure up to that. So God has to justify us through other means. And as he justifies us, he makes us right through the gift that God has given us through, as Romans 3.24 says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the salvation, the free gift of God, God makes us right with him through the work of Jesus, not through our work. If at any, any moment, at any part of you, the way you think of your salvation, if you give yourself any credit in any way with anything, you've overstepped your bounds. You have to give God credit through what Jesus has done for your, your salvation. You have, to get, you have to realize the amazing free gift that God has given you that you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to receive it. God did that work in your heart. That's why you should say, God saved me. You don't say, I ordered him to save me because I asked him to do it. No, it's a work of God. It's not your work. It's a free gift through Jesus. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what you earned. That's what I earned. Death. Total death destruction. That's what we earned. That's what we worked for. That's what we deserve. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. It's the gift of salvation in our hearts that has awakened us to the truth of who God is. Before you received that gift, you were deaf to any truth to the goodness of God. You were blind to the truth. You had no eyes to see. You had no ears to, to hear. You had no heart to receive. You were dead, as the Bible says, in your sins and trespasses. What can a dead person do? Nothing. They definitely can't wake up and say, I want that gift. God has to awaken us, and that is the amazing free gift of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. We don't have anything to boast and brag about in salvation. If we boast in anything, we boast in the cross. We boast in what Jesus has done. We say, I'm a believer. He gave me the free gift of salvation through the work of Jesus on the cross. Salvation is a gift. If anybody in here, if you're a recipient of the gift of God, salvation, you have been blessed with the most amazing gift that has ever been conceived and is graciously given to you freely. What you earned is death. What you received is this free gift of salvation. So first and foremost, salvation is a gift. We have to be reminded of that. Second, salvation is a life. Salvation is a life. So you get this free gift of salvation. You receive this gift. But what do you do? Do you just leave that nicely packaged present in the corner of your living room and, like, don't open it? Wouldn't it be crazy if, like, you went to your family's Christmas and here they are with all these presents and they said, all right, this is the best one for you. Like, just think of your little kid self. I know y'all are old now and too cool to get excited about Christmas presents. But think of your little kid self. And everybody's excited about the big present over there. Well, that's mine. It has my name on it. It's my gift. It's been purchased for me a long time ago. I don't know when they bought it, but it's been purchased for me. That looks amazing. It's heavy. There's something great in that. That is an amazing gift for me, and I'm going to leave it wrapped up in the corner of my house for the rest of my life. That would be crazy. No kid would do that. So when we say salvation is a life, that means we receive this free gift of God in salvation. When someone has told us about Jesus, as they have gone out and been obedient to the work of God and sharing the gospel with people, that, that gift has come into their life. 
and they receive it and then it begins a life of salvation it's a lifestyle it's taking the work that God has done in our heart and 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 run with it that's what he said in verse in this last part of verse 6 but even in verse 7 says walk in him rooted built up we sing build my life tonight built up in him established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving these are a bunch of ing type words this is stuff that's happening this is something that starts now and like rolls out to the rest of your life think of it like that think of salvation as this giant stake that's been planted down in the heart of your life and it hits and then it just ripple has this ripple effect to the end of your life it's just who you are the rest of your life the rest of your life you're walking in him as Paul says in Colossians you're rooted in Christ Jesus the rest of your life why do you need to be rooted in him because other things are going to want to try to move you and some of you are old enough to know that that happens you get situated in your in your faith and then something comes along to try to pull you away from that right that's why he's saying being rooted in him so you walk in him you're rooted in him you're built up in him why do you need to be built up you you're built up in Christ because yeah you're saved it's secure but the storms of life are going to come your way and there's going to be things that are going to want to try to knock you off course not just pick you up and move you off course bad things can happen to try to come and knock you over but if you are built up in Christ as he says in Colossians built up in him in salvation and established in him when something is established that means it's it has this start moment it's kind of set up and it's 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 already it's there now like if you start a company or if you start a business you have to get it incorporated and it has to be established that's why there's some building around here that you can go to this company or this store and they might have a little a little tag on the building that says what established in so and so maybe you have that in your home um, I think my in-laws I think on their door it says uh, Mayo established in like 19 something I can't remember when they got when my in-laws got married but it's it's there's this established you're being you are being established in him set secure you are being built up in him and this is all through a lifestyle of salvation and here let me give you some simple ways of thinking about salvation being a lifestyle you are intentionally remaining in him you're intentionally be intentional about remain like abiding the, the Bible uses the word abide you abide in Christ you're intentional about that that means every day you wake up and you think about okay how can God how can God use me today how can he teach me today how can how can I focus on him today it has to do this it's an intentional work of you abiding in him so you intentionally stay focused on him but you also intentionally grow in him so, some of you maybe have this New Year's resolution kind of thing where you wanted to have more uh, spiritual fervor in your life you're like I'm gonna read my Bible more I'm going to pray more this new year and I didn't talk a whole lot about it because I think that you need to you need to think about those New Year's resolutions like it's a new day resolution like every single day you tell yourself today's a new day it's it's a new day I'm gonna start today intentionally growing in him intentionally abiding in him so you can ask yourself some questions think when you think about this are you abide are you remaining in him and I think a good answer for that when you think about that is what is your level of attention to God's word that's what you should ask yourself what's my level of attention to God's word is it just when it happens sure when I'm like I might I might pick up God's word and flip through it but are you seeking God's word out are there is there a time in your life where you like I'm gonna set some things that aren't as important aside and I'm going to read the Bible so that that's how you know if you're abiding in him and growing in him as well if I say salvation is a life 
And it's about abiding or remaining in his, in his love or, or remaining in him and growing in him. Both of those can be measured by our level of attention to his word. See, God, is, God has made you spiritually hungry. If you're a believer, if you've been awakened to the truth of Jesus and you have been saved, as we say, then God has made you hungry for him. And you're going to be hungry for him, and you need to feast on him and his word. Because if you don't, you'll start starving in a way on the inside. And people who are spiritually starving, they could be in church every single time the church doors open. They could be at every event. They could listen to Christian music occasionally, but they could still be starving spiritually. Because they don't have any type of attention in their life to God's word. That's why it's so important for us as we talk about DNA groups, as we talk about how from our MCs we pull together smaller groups to read the Bible together. Like that's the, really the, if I were to sum up the purpose of those DNA groups, it's just we're going to read the Bible together. And then flowing out of that, God does a lot of extra things through that as we grow, as we remain, as we abide in Him. So that's a good way to think of it. Both abiding and growing can be measured by our attention to God's Word and you know what happens from that? It says at the end of verse 7, abounding in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So if you're growing in your love for God and you're abiding in Him, you'll know it by your attention to God's Word. And if that's the case, you will be a grateful person. And you know what is so amazing? Grateful people. If you have people in your life that are grateful, they're great to have around. They got a, they're in a good mood a lot of times. They're not complaining. People who are grateful, they're not complaining. Things might be falling apart, and, and they're like, well, you know, we got a lot we can still be thankful for. You're like, what are you talking about, man? Nothing works in your, in your, in your house, and your, your car doesn't work, like you get, your job's not working, like nothing's going, nothing. well, we got a lot to be thankful for. And that's part of just working out your life of salvation. That free gift that God has given you, you've opened it up. And you're like, this is me. This is my life now. Number three, salvation is a stewardship. Salvation is stewardship. Verse 8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive. And he says, see to it. Meaning, hey, of all this stuff that's going on, pay attention to this right here. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So there's a lot of spirituality going on in our world today. There's a lot of little things that people want to do and want to think that are, that, that are in there. They're like spiritualizing things. Or there could be something, I don't know, from a show that you've seen. or some, I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause people to misplace their value system. So Paul's saying, hey, look, there's a lot of teaching. There's a lot of things going on there. You've got to see to it. You're... You have this free gift of salvation, but you also have to, like, manage it. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy of empty deceit, according to human tradition or according to elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So what a steward does, a steward guards and oversees what has been entrusted to them. And the word steward comes from, a long time ago, somebody that owned some pigs. It was their sty of pigs. And they would go out of town, and they would need somebody to watch their pigs. They would be a styward. And so the styward was somebody who would be guarding or watching over the pig sty. That's where we get the word steward. It says, it's, it's, it's like protecting and guarding something that's been entrusted to us. Now, yes, I know that my salvation is mine, but my salvation is also God's salvation. Your salvation is yours, but it's also God's salvation. It's the work that he's done in your heart. That's his work. So in a way, God has given you this salvation, and he's caused you to see how important it is, and you want to be a good steward of it. You want, it, you want to do whatever you can to make sure it grows and is built up and is rooted and is abiding. You want to make sure you, you, you pay attention to it. And here's how it can look if you slack off in being a steward of your salvation. You hear talks like this, and you get uncomfortable, or you get convicted, or you're just like, no, that's not, that's not me. Why, why, do we, why do we feel like that? It's because God has entrusted you with this amazing gift of salvation, 
And he knows that if you've, been a, if you've become a believer in him, that he's also given you the work of going and being on mission for him and telling others, but you've been a poor steward. You've let other things happen to what you've been entrusted with instead of taking what God has given you and making sure you do with it according to what he wants you to do with it. You, you, you know, you protect, you guard something that you consider valuable. And I don't know if it's a, um, if it's some kind of old family jewelry, um, if it's a really expensive artifact that has been passed down family and family to family. That's not something you just leave out in the flower bed out front, is it? As I was thinking about it, something that is valuable that has been entrusted to us, I was thinking about how, you know, how we're so infatuated with, with rare and valuable antiques. Have you noticed that? That's why there's a show called Antique Roadshow. Now, that's the goofiest show in the world, but I don't know why. I can watch that a long time. There's some really old guy who knows words that I don't use and who's an expert at 14th century broken Chinese pot and bowls. Like, that's his thing. Like, why are you in that? Like, you're an interesting guy. That's your thing. And so he's sitting there with this lady who's got the bowl, and she's like, well, it's passed on to the winner. Been putting it on the top shelf. And he's like, well, that's way more valuable than you realize. You need to insure it. And in fact, you need to, and they're always like, oh, you realize how amazing expensive it is, and it's the goofiest thing in the world. It really is. I, I just, I'll rewind it and watch their reaction again. Like, and sometimes, this is, how, this is how weird I am. Sometimes I'll like talk to the person and I'll tell them something and then play, and then they respond to me. They're like, Whoa! Like, like, hey, I got, a, I got a deal at Walmart on something. Play. Whoa! I really have never done that, but you should do that. That would be funny. So think about the, the amazing gift of God that's been entrusted to you in salvation. The movie Sandlot, the Babe Ruth baseball. The baseball's been sa- signed by Babe Ruth. Smalls didn't know that was an important baseball. He just took it off the shelf, and they're throwing it outside in the, in the yard with the kids, and they hit it over the fence into the beast pen. And it's, it's a precious gift, man. I would love to have a baseball signed by Babe Ruth right now. You know, if you want to unsteward that and let me steward it for you, I'll do that. What If it's valuable, then you'll do what you can to make sure everything, everything works right with it. And that's the same with salvation. You don't get saved, and you're like, all right, well, I'm going to go over here and do my thing. No, you get saved and you hang on to it. And you, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, as it says in Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more so in my absence, Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean, hey, you might get saved, so work really hard so you can be saved. No, he's saying... Look, the free gift of God and salvation is yours. You need to work hard at stewarding that very well. So we see salvation is a gift. It's a life. It's a stewardship. And number four, salvation is Christ-centered. All of salvation is centered on the person and work of Jesus. It's got to be. And we see in verses 9 through 12, Paul really lays it out in kind of threefold. So we, if we say salvation is Christ-centered, the first thing that we can say with that is, is his life. I don't know if it's going to... Yeah, so salvation is Christ-centered. The first part is his life. So verse 9 and 10 says, For in him, so in Christ, the whole fullness of God, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in his life. You have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So when we talk about Christ being the center of salvation, salvation's got to be Christ-centered. It's about his life. All of God is in all of Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. The work of salvation is complete in the work of Christ. So what Jesus has done on the cross is enough for all of your salvation. And the work of Christ not only is enough, but it completes our salvation. So the, the present, the free gift is, is done. It's been fully accomplished. And all of, all of what Jesus lived in his life, all of his love and his grace and his mercy and his justice and his patience, 
thank God, his, his holiness. All of that is in Christ because all of God is in Christ. And then Paul says something that's very special. He says, all that is in Christ is in you. So when we think about the life that Christ lived, 2,000 something years ago, it seems like it's a long way away. The things that he did and said and accomplished are far away as a long time ago. But he lived that life, that perfect life that you should live. And he accomplished things that you're supposed to accomplish. But salvation has been imparted to us by the life of Christ. So all of that, Jesus, all of that, that Jesus has done in his life, that's, that's in us as well. That's when we have to say salvation is Christ-centered. See, the thing that gets you hung up sometimes is spiritually, you kind of get spiritually depressed because you feel like you're not measuring up to what God is calling you to do. You feel like you're not living up to that standard that God is calling you to live up to. Well, what are you, gonna, what are you supposed to be doing to be living up to that? Everything perfectly all the time? You can't do that. Congratulations, though. Someone else has done it for you. And that's the perfect life that Jesus lived. All of that, he lived that, and you're in him. That's, so if, if you're not getting this part of it, that salvation is Christ-centered, you're missing a lot of it, and it's, it can be troubling on the inside. Because you've had a, maybe you have a rough day coming up, and you lay your head down at night, and you can count four or five dozen sins that cause you to really just kind of feel terrible. And then you're, you go to bed thinking you're an absolute loser and never can do anything right, and God hates you. That, that means your salvation is not Christ-centered. Your salvation is you-centered. Your salvation is not you-centered, it's Christ-centered. And his perfect work that he completed and perfected in his perfect life. Not your life. Your life is not perfect. You're like me, scumbag, who can't seem to do anything right. That's why I have to rely and trust on Jesus' life and what he's done. And then the next thing Paul goes into, not only Christ's life, when you talk about Christ's center of salvation, but his death. It's good to remind us that Jesus lived a perfect life that we're required to live to be justified according to a holy God. He did that for us. And then, not only that, but he died the death that we deserve to die. That's when Paul says, in him also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now, the Jewish people, like the talk of circumcision is a lot different than our talk of circumcision today. Back then, it's a, a symbol of identity. If that's not the case, then you're not in God, basically what they said for the ancient Jewish people. But Paul is saying, look, it's, 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 a, it's a heart circumcision. And it's made by Christ, putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Look, when you look at the death of Jesus, if you, if you were to study the crucifixion of Jesus, you would come to a conclusion that it's a horrendous thing. It's bloody. It's disgusting. It's not something that you would watch and be like, that's interesting. You would throw up. You would walk away. You'd be like, that's enough. I can't stand it. I can't handle it. When you read the Bible, read the Old Testament, you realize, you know, the Bible, the Bible's a bloody book. It really is bloody. There's a lot of bloody stuff happening in the Bible. There's a, especially in the Old Testament, you start talking about animal sacrifices and stuff like that. I don't know how much you love the smell of blood. There's a lot of blood in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The writer of Hebrews, who we're not really sure who it is, but the writer of Hebrews was an expert on the Old Testament. Like, a, just an absolute expert. So that's why the, the writer says, indeed, under the law, as we see in the Old Testament, under the covenant of the law, not the covenant of grace that we're in in Christ, but under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. That's why people have to make sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. The Day of Atonement, the high priest had to come into the holiest of holies with sacrifice. And they had all year round, they were making sacrifices. Things were dying all the time for their sins. All the time. In Hebrews 10, 10, 4, 
it says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Why is it saying that? Because, you know, as we you get to the point to where you sit, and, and I wrestled with this growing up. I got to a point in my spiritual life where I was like, hold on a minute. Let's, let's think about it. There could probably be a better way. Jesus, he was amazing when you read his life. He, was, he, he did nothing wrong, ever. He was genuine. He loved people. He had to die. Like, he had to be brutally beaten to a bloody pulp. That's the only way? And he had to, like, suffocate on the cross. As he was dying on the cross, that's really how people, scientists say that's how people died on the cross. As, is, as they were piercing their wrists and their legs, they would, it would be so completely worn out, exhausted, that they would be drooping down, and they couldn't breathe like this. So they had to raise up to get air. And then slide back down because they would like jag. The, a lot of times they would chop the back of the cross to, and their back was completely, the flesh was ripped off of his back because of the whips and everything. I mean, I would, I would hate being there. Even if I didn't know the person, I'd be like, get him, get him down. Like, why? What? That's a lot. That's a lot of blood. <laughs> There's got to be another way. There's got to be a less bloody way. But there's not a less bloody way. Jesus had to die. The only way that God could fully show his love for you and the extent of his love for you is for his son to be brutally slaughtered. And in his death, the Bible says that Jesus takes your penalty and my penalty. The death that you should die, he takes that upon himself on the cross. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, Jesus had to die. The dirt and the blood made like blood mud at the bottom of the cross. It had to be there. The tears mixed in with blood coming down Jesus' face, it had to happen. He had to die. Apart from the shedding of Jesus' blood, you could not have the free gift of salvation. Somebody has to pay the penalty of sin. Wrath and judgment and justice had to be poured out on sin. And God knows that we don't have the life to measure up to his perfection. So Jesus steps in and lives that life that we talked about in salvation. And God knows also that somebody has to pay. Somebody had to, to pay the penalty. Jesus Christ died in your place for your sins. So you don't have to die. He died on the cross you should be crucified on. He took the punishment you deserve. I'm a wretched sinner. If I just think for the cro about the cross for a minute, I want to scream, I should be up there. Get him down. I need to be being crucified. I'm the filthy murderous wretch that needs to take my punishment that I deserve and then the judge of the high court of heaven says no I'm going to put your punishment on my perfect son who's done nothing wrong Jesus had to die in Christ the Christ centered salvation by his perfect life by his substitutionary death as he dies in your place as a substitute <clears throat> But praise God, he doesn't stay dead. His resurrection. Salvation is Christ-centered because of his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's why Paul goes on to say, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. So my salvation has got to be Christ-centered. It's got to be based on the work, the perfect life of Jesus and what he's done in his horrific death. And how he died for me in my place for my sins as a substitute. He took, took my punishment for my sins when he died. And he was buried. And I was buried with him. But I resurrected with him. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united with him in his death like, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in his resurrection like his. So if you're a believer, you are united in your salvation with Christ and his perfect life, his 
substitutionary death and his victorious resurrection. And you really, at some point in your life, got to get to the point to where you hear that and you just groan with an amen. Thank you, God. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. I love the way Peter says that. If you're a believer, God caused that to happen. He's caused us to be born again. To a living hope through what? Through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So, we see salvation is a gift. Salvation is life. Salvation is stewardship. Salvation is Christ-centered. And the last thing, salvation reeks. I know when you read that, it sounds like it's very kind of crude to say it like that salvation reeks of death salvation reeks of death I love reading and studying the the passages that Paul writes concerning he talks about himself like he's a dead man he talks about himself like he has been just he's been dead a long time he talks about people who are alive in Christ now they've been dead for a long time too so in the next passage we see and you he says who were dead in your trespasses and the circum- circumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your, our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set aside nailing it to the cross. That's powerful right there. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. Dead. So because of sin, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, everywhere, all over the place, people are suffering, and they're suffering the pains of death. Nope, I don't understand how anybody could get used to the smell of death. If something, an animal or a creature dies in your attic or something like that, you're not going to be like, hmm, new Glade plug-in smell, right? No, it's just like, oh, like when there was some dead stuff in here, like we, we, we couldn't get rid of the smell. It was a stench. It reeked. And salvation, in a way, kind of reeks. It reeks of your death. At some point in your spiritual head and your spiritual heart, you ought to be kind of close to your old dead self where you can a little bit still smell like that was the dead me that's the old dead me over there dead and gone he's buried and been long dead long gone now I'm in Christ I'm alive in him so no I I mean the Bible consistently consistently reminds us that we were dead in sin Ephesians 2 1 says and you were dead in your trespasses and sin so anytime you talk about your salvation you still smell death a little bit because that was you that was me but not only does salvation reek of death salvation reeks of victory i know that's kind of the wrong way to say that salvation reeks of victory and you know what overpowers powers the smell of death and salvation it's the smell of victory oh yeah you can be reminded a little bit and the bible reminds you that you were dead in your sins and trespasses you used to be dead now you're alive but the overpowering smell of the victory that we have in christ just drowns out any noise of death that we still kind of hear ringing sometimes. And you should be reminded of the victory that you have in Christ. If you're a believer, if you've been saved, then your salvation just eludes this amazing smell of victory. And it just quiets any voice or any smell of death. He dis, verse 15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him so in the first century mind what they heard when they heard this is what they saw in their mind's eye was if a a conquering army were to come into a city or a country and what they would do is they would come in they would clean house they would wipe out they would totally just obliterate their enemy and then they would parade the losers maybe by slaves or whatever they would pray parade them through the streets and as people were cheering the old enemy is just being paraded around, probably in shamefulness, as much grotesque shame as they could do. They probably just drugged them around like on leashes like they were animals and probably had them completely naked. It was very shameful. So what God is saying to us is that in salvation, what God has done is he has defeated the enemy in Christ. Not only did he defeat him, He strolled him through the streets in open shame, and everybody can see that he's been defeated. But you don't always feel like that, do you? You don't always feel like the enemy has been defeated in your life. A lot of times you feel like the enemy's on top. The enemy's winning. 
that it's like this fight. It's this war that sometimes, sometimes God's getting a couple of shots in and they're working. And sometimes Satan's, you know, he's got some combos that work pretty good. And it's not a fight, y'all. It's not a fight. It's, it, the Bible just says that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. You know what? That screams to me and it should to you. Victory. The chant is crying out in the street for us. Victory, victory, victory. We have won, but we still fight. We still fight the good fight of the faith, but we don't fight for victory one day where we fight really hard. One day we're going to achieve our victory. We fight from victory, not to victory, from it. Why? Because we've already, we've already won. And I know we're going to fully win because I've read the rest of the book. I know how it ends. We win. And right now, here's what I know. A lot of us in here and a lot of us that might be listening to this, we don't feel like we're winning. We don't. And a lot of that has to do with some point of your, how you interact with your salvation. Maybe you're, you have not received the free gift of salvation. Or maybe you're not as rooted and established in your salvation as you should. Or maybe you're not Christ-centered as much as you should be in your salvation. Maybe you haven't glorified Christ as much as you should be in your salvation. You know, Romans 6, 9 says, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And that's in us, too. Romans 6, 11, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You should ask yourself, Do I feel alive? Eh, some days, hmm. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead also give life to your, our mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. That's victory talk, y'all. Victory, victory. Then we have to ask ourselves, why are we moping around like we don't have this victory? And maybe track back through and Take a good look at how that's your salvation and how you steward it and how you interact with it. God made us alive in Christ. Believer, look, you were, you were once dead in your sins, and you're alive now. You were once completely alienated from God, an enemy of God, who hated God, wanted nothing to do with Him, and He made you alive, and He adopted you, changed your name from lost broken wretch to found, saved, loved. Now you get to sit at the king's table for the rest of your life and even into eternity. Forgiving all of your sins, canceling all your debt. He made you alive through the death of Jesus on the cross. You were, you were dead before. Now you're alive. That's the treasure of our salvation. Back up to being go time. You realize that if you're a believer, all of what I'm talking about, that's that's the you're the recipient of that gift. So when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Go into the world, proclaim the gospel, that's what people need to hear. That's what need people need to see in me and in you. That truth, that reality. It's go time. People have to hear that. Everywhere I go, everywhere I look, people are people there's not a whole lot of victory out there. If you're not a believer, if you're listening, I think you're on the edge. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening. You're on the edge of something great. I just want to, like, nudge you off the edge and be like, okay, I'm in. I'm going to jump. I want to take a step of faith into this greatest gift. So I want to encourage you if you're a believer. Dig into your salvation a little more. Not only just dig into it, but realize the worth of it and realize what God is calling you to do with it is we're reminded of the mission of God that somebody in your life, I'm willing to bet that everybody in here, if you're a believer, God has put somebody in your life that needs you to be a little bit braver with them and talk about their spiritual reality. Instead of being like, hey, you want to come to church with me sometime? Yeah, I might do that. I mean, that conversation can happen a long time. But the conversation also can go a little deeper when you say, hey, you know, I just got to tell you that 
and then watch God lead you as you step bravely into that conversation. I've seen like a pattern of life in you that's just kind of looks just spiritually broken. And I'm not trying to be judgy or anything like that. I'm just saying what I see and because I'm reminded of the way I used to be when I was apart from Christ and I didn't have a relationship with God. And I really think what you need in your life is to know Jesus and to know the power of salvation in your own life. And they could totally just slam a door in your face. Or they could start melting a little bit in your hand. And then when they're like, yeah, I think I need to know that. Do not say, all right, well, I'm going to get my pastor to call you. No, look, that door had been opened right there in front of you. Then you look at them in the eye and you say, it's really easy. You know, God's calling you in faith to, to receive him and to believe in him. You just need to open up your heart to Jesus. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to have everything right. You just got to take a step towards him in faith. You think you want to do that? And they're like, like right here in the break room at work, right here. Why not? Like right here in the car as we're driving to our next stop. Yeah, why not? Okay, yeah, I think I want to do that. What do I do? And you're also equipped with following up with that too. And then you can guide them in a way that they can pray and confess their sin and you know, confess their need for Jesus and confess their desire that they want to be saved and born again and be forgiven. And then you, as, they've, if you, as you kind of led them through that, <clears throat> then you need to be like, now I really want to introduce you to my pastor and we need to talk about you getting baptized. And he's going to make me baptize you. And, I'm, and I am. <laughs> and it's going to be great. There's a, there's a world out there that are people have disconnected from the truth. If we really sunk our teeth into what we have in salvation if we really did that then we would take we would we'd roll with it we would go and wherever we were and we would talk to people about it even if we knew we were about to get shut down even if we knew we were about to get fired even if we knew we were about to lose friends even if we knew we were about to die which is not going to happen it happens in our world right now in other parts of the world there are believers right now Christians in the faith, brothers and sisters of ours in Christ, that are standing up against a sharp blade right now. And they're not backing down. They're standing looking down a loaded barrel of a gun right now, and they're not backing down. They look at that gun with all my heart, I'm not changing, pull the trigger if you have to. And we can be, our, we can, that can fan our flame a little bit. I mean, we might be there one day in our country, I don't know. And I've talked to people in heavily persecuted areas. And I've seen the fire in their eyes because they've dug deep into their salvation. Before you're going to be successful in the mission of God, and before you're going to feel like you're conquering what God has put before you in his mission, you really got to dig deep in what he's done in his mission to you and opening up your heart in salvation. And when you do, just buckle up because God's going to send you places. He's going to open up your heart to the brokenness around you. And you're going to say, yes, Lord. Wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. Whatever you tell me to say, I'll say. And then buckle up, people. It's about to be a wild ride of obedience on the mission of God. It's going to be the best thing ever. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word tonight. God, however you're convicting us tonight, God, I pray that we would be obedient. Lord, if there's somebody in here that needs to take that first step that first plunge into salvation god i pray that you would just give them the courage to do that god you're drawing them to yourself Lord, i pray that they would open up their hard heart to the truth of who you are jesus Lord, i pray for the believer god i pray for the one that is in here that they know you but maybe they haven't taken that brave step to to be baptized god i pray that they would say i'm ready to be baptized i know i'm a, I'm a believer i know i'm a christ follower but i need to take that next step of obedience and baptism. So God, I pray for that person that you give them courage to do that. God, I pray for the believer that is, uh, they've, they've kind of shoved their salvation and the beauty of the treasure that their salvation is, they've kind of like shoved it off to the side of the, all the extra things going on in their life, God. And Lord, I'm, I'm guilty of that in a lot of ways. And I pray that we would realize the treasure that we have of our salvation and just sink deep into that and be reminded of that. God, and as we are obedient to you, God, we go in obedience to a world that's hurting and broken. 
And God, we want to love people. We want to share your word. And we want to show people that people need you, Jesus. Thank you for entrusting your mission to us. I pray, God, that you find us faithful. Give us courage and a blazing fire of boldness to do what you've called us to do. We love you. We pray this in your good name. Amen. Amen. We're not going to have any type of uh, response or invitation, but I do want to encourage you to uh, go to somebody that you know in here, somebody that you trust, somebody that can pray for you, somebody that you want to uh, confide in with something like this, and get some accountability with this. Go to somebody and say, hey, you know, I'm, I've, been in, I've been challenged lately. I've been encouraged but challenged lately a little bit, and I want you to, I want you to think about uh, praying for me when you can, when you're thinking about praying. And I want to... I wanna, I want to do more with what God's called me to do. Like that's, that's why it's good to, to go across the aisle sometimes. It's good to come to me and Mike and Bradley when you, know, you need to, but it's also good to go to one another. and um, you know, Invite somebody to your MC. Invite somebody to church. Ask a coworker. Ask a neighbor. Look, you don't have to get super spiritual all the time. Maybe just go to them and say, hey, um, you know, I've invited you to church a couple times, and that's fine, but I'm about to go pray. I'm about to go pray for some things that I want to pray about. Well, how can I pray for you? That's kind of a bold thing to ask your neighbor, right? It's kind of a bold thing to ask a coworker. Maybe. Just ask them, how can I pray for you? And I might be like, um, I'm good. Then you can take it a step further. Really? Can't pray for you about anything? I've done that before. I love doing that when I'm at a, a restaurant and we have a server come up. And before you pray for your meal, you ask your server, is there anything we can pray for you about? We're about to pray. And they're like, no, I'm good. I've had that happen. Then I'm like, really? Nothing? Yeah, I'm good. Are you sure? And sometimes they're like, you're not getting away from me on this, are you? And then I'll say, he's like, nothing's going on with like your family or a friend, your personal life, anything that we can pray for you about? I've literally had a server sit down and weep at the table with us before. Just crying, boohooing, crying. And I always said, can I pray for you? Why does that happen? It happens because God is doing the work in people's hearts and he's using you. And he wants to use you to do more. So, Come across the aisle this week. Get on the phone. Call somebody in your MC in, in the next week or so. Like, talk about how we're interacting with the mission of God and encourage one another to do a little bit more. I heard Bradley talk about his group's going to be kind of sinking more into Aniston and things like that. That's good. That's real good. Yeah, we were in the newsletter that they recently published, but we don't want to go, well, good job, church. We want to be like, well, we don't want to be in the newsletter. We want to be in all their hearts. We want them to know that we're praying for them and things like that. So 